Britain's conversation. This is LBC with Stig Abel. Call 0345 60 60 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Very good afternoon, Stig Abel here this Sunday afternoon on LBC until 6pm. There's really been one major story this week that I want to hear your views on. It's about the junior doctors' strike. Uh, joining me in a moment will be two junior doctors, or pretty senior junior doctors, who can be able to call, answer your calls about why the strikes are coming and what life is really like for them. My thesis I want to explore with you is this. In a battle between Jeremy Hunt and a bunch of people committed to saving your lives, who are you really going to trust more? The doctors or the politicians? And when these strikes happen, are you willing to accept that the doctors are in it for the best reasons? You tell me. 0345 60 60 973. And it is unquestionably the biggest story of the week, the strike of the junior doctors. You may have thought this had gone away, of course, but although the head of the British Medical Association agreed the new deal a few months ago, the BMA membership, of course, voted against it, 58% to 42%. Then last week, the BMA Council, without formally consulting the membership, which support you might come to later on, voted by 16 to 14, probably, to impose a rolling set of all-out strikes. As we all know, the first one starts on September the 12th and lasts for five days. And we all know or think we know what the dispute is about. Jeremy Hunt has, in spite of the ongoing disagreement, decided to impose the contract on the doctors. A couple of remaining points seem to be at issue. Hunt's decision to say Saturday is a normal working day, so not subject to additional pay. And the question of automatic pay rises for part-time workers. And that, according to one narrative, is it. And you and I have discussed doctors and strikes before, haven't we? And I've spoken to hundreds of you, I think, over the last couple of years, telling me this... We love the doctors, we hate the politicians. Most of all, that mannequin-faced numpty Jeremy Hunt. Humpty Numpty, we could call him, I suppose. I went on Sky News this week and I was told that the British population would turn on these junior doctors, that this was the last straw, that they would be unpopular forever, that the public was now opposed to them. And what I said on, on Sky News, I'm kind of saying now, you're talking cobblers. The great British public, as represented by the fine listeners of LBC, back the doctors because doctors don't lie. Doctors are only in their game to help people. Doctors save our lives and comfort us when our family is at its lowest ebb. Why would they strike unnecessarily? I said that the British public would stick with the doctors through all of this. Was I right? Have you changed your minds at all? Have you been left uneasy? at all. That's why I want you to tell me this afternoon because on the face of it the doctor's position is slightly weaker than it was before as Numpty Hunty said himself as he blinked like that bloke from the thick of it through a series of interviews on Thursday. What has changed since the BMA leadership approved the deal a few months ago? The BMA in May said this, this deal is a good deal for doctors, a good deal for patients, it's good for the NHS and it's good for equality. That's pretty clear approval. And it's not entirely clear that even a majority of doctors back this next strike do they? Senior doctors are chuntering the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges has said they are disappointed at the prospect of further sustained industrial action by junior doctors. We do not consider the proposed strikes are proportionate. And if the centre of the row is about Saturday pay, where does the issue of patient safety come in? And if the BMA Council is so sure of its position, why did it not ballot its members? Why did the strike only just command a majority? Why do five days off in such short notice? These are all troubling questions, which we can get into over the next hour. But I said this on Thursday night, and I'm saying it now. The British public loves its doctors and it distrusts its politicians. The public will back them even if lives are imperiled and operations cancelled. Because that's what I've heard from you guys over the last year. Tell me if you think I'll hear it this afternoon. 0345 60 60 973. And ask questions. I'm joined very kindly by two doctors. Dr Marianne Noronha, an emergency registrar, and Dr Rishi Deer, an orthopaedic registrar, one year from no longer being a junior doctor. They're here to answer your questions. I want you to know what it's like being a doctor and why the imposition of the contract is a problem. Because... I could say it and you'll read about it, but, you know, talk to these doctors, ask them what their lives are like. Why are they concerned about the future of the NHS? Why do they think that the imposition of the contract is a bad de deal? 0345 60 60 973, text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Guys, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Why don't we start at, at, at the beginning, I suppose? How far away from agreement are we really with uh, Jeremy Hunt? Because... 
on one hand, this seems to be largely about whether you guys should get more pay on a Saturday or not. Is that a fair characterization of the position? Well, Stig, actually, I don't think that's a fair characterization. Um, and I think there's been a lot of confusion and, and spin sort of bandied around. The biggest thing that we're worried about, first of all, is the, the government, at the moment we have a five-day non-emergency service and we have a seven-day emergency service. So people can be seen by a doctor um, with a heart attack, with an injury, whenever they come in at any time of day. Now that service is struggling as it is. We've shown that there's 20% rotor gaps at the moment. I've got direct experience of that. I've worked rotors where there's three doctors covering eight, where you are barely able to do operations safely as we are at the moment. Now what the government wants to do is they want to stretch those five days of non-emergency service out to seven without putting in extra funding. And that's what I'm really up in arms about. Um, it's been made to look like a pay deal. Yeah. So what I'm saying to you is I think we are quite far from a deal because this whole thing of cost neutrality, negotiating this five days into seven without spending any extra money on ex any extra services, it's just not possible. It's absolutely not possible at all. So why is this, uh, and Maria, maybe you can jump in on this as well, why is therefore this about raising the issue of this Saturday pay? If Jeremy Hunt said, okay, we will make Saturday uh, exceptional working hours, they're no longer classed as an ordinary working day, you'll get extra money for it. Would the strike stop at that point? Um, so I don't think that it's been made about this Saturday pay issue, but I think if Jeremy Hunt said, we'll pay you more on Saturday, we'd, we still would be where we are today. Really? Yeah, totally. It's not about that. It's about trying to get a seven-day service for the same price of five days and stretching a workforce that is already, honestly speaking, at breaking point. I mean, you've already heard over the past few weeks about A&E closures all across the country. Two, definitely, one paediatric A&E that's closing. We know about all these rotor gaps. We, we're at breaking point already. We just cannot do more for the same amount of money. It just is not possible. It will put our patients at risk because we need more doctors to cover those days. It's not just about that money. So, so if, that, if, that, if that's the case, and I, I totally accept what you, you're saying, how has it been painted this way and why did the BMA your body say this deal is a good deal for doctors a good deal for patients it's good for the NHS and good for equality that's what they said in May so I think the BMA did the best they could at that moment with the conditions that they were under which was it had to be a cost neutral pay package and they did the best they could and they came back to their members with the best contract that they could negotiate at that at that point and we said we just can't accept this because it's fundamentally flawed with that cost neutrality. So, uh, Rishi, what would it take? What would need to be... Because I think one of these things, people get very angry about this and, and they get fixated on the Saturday pay for some legitimacy because that's seen as a sticking mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. What does Hunt need to bring to the table? The contracts are going to happen at some point. He's going to impose them anyway. But what fundamentally... Does he need to say, I need to give 100 million quid more or so, 50 million more? What does he need to do to, for uh, you guys to go, you know what, that's good enough? Okay, so step one, you need to drop in position. Okay, And the reason why you have to drop in position is because not only the doctors themselves, but Hunt's own... A Department of Health team through their risk register that was leaked last week, that risk register said that there is not enough staffing to deliver a safe seven-day service. They said there is not enough time for implementation. They said there is a five out of five score risk for severity, that this will cause damage to harm to patients, not just in terms of illness, but in terms of deaths. So you can't impose a contract and make us complicit in delivering something that we will know will lead to patient harm. Okay, so that's the first step. Number two, if it is his true intention to produce a seven-day non-emergency service, and we're told, you know, that this is the, the British people's decision, it's the British people's mandate, they want a seven-day non-emergency service. But actually, when the government's own surveys were, were given to the British people, 127,000 people were surveyed, and less than 3% thought that actually doing a seven-day non-emergency service was important. They actually felt that stre improving the five-day service was was actually more of a so priority. Like just to be clear so, of our terms, this is like dermatology. This is saying that a dermatology uh, clinic in a hospital correct. should be open on a Sunday morning. Correct, correct. Uh, and is this just creeping modernity? I, one of the questions, you know, I've talked a lot about, you know, you talk about tube drivers, you mm -hmm. know, you talk about the media have gone from a very five-day place where people were very mm -hmm. comfortable working five-day weeks, but the world has changed... Uh, and the world is now 24-7. So in some ways, modernity is forcing this change because we expect things to be open 24-7. But Stig, as, as I've explained to you, the NHS is open 24-7 in terms of emergencies. 
I've worked the last five Christmases. I've worked nights for the last 10 years. I've worked weekends. It's an absolute normal part of my life and it's a normal part of yeah. Marion's as well. That's a normal part of our daily practice. So to say that doctors don't work weekends is a myth. Just going back to what you said before, what does he need to do? Number one, he needs to drop in position. But number two, if he is so determined to push through the seven day service, then absolutely, I am not reticent against that. I am all for a seven day non-emergency service. I stand here on LBC today to say that if it is properly funded and if it is properly costed, show me a spreadsheet with figures. Yeah. Show me exactly what it's going to require because I'll just give you one example. I, I do a hip operation list. On, let's say I do a hip operation list on a Sunday. I know to run a hip operation, I require six staff minimum. That's without training, just six staff. I require nurses, I require auxiliary staff, I require anaesthetists, doctors, etc. And that's not even counting the people to look after that patient on the ward. So are you telling me by increasing the number of junior doctors on at a weekend, not increasing funding, so you'll take them from midweek, you are going to improve throughput? You won't. That's interesting. We have to go uh, to, to a break now, but I'd like to, because one of the things I want people, because people sort of chunter on about this issue. Mm. You've got a chance now, guys, to talk to two doctors about their lives, about what they actually feel is happening to their industry, to their working environment. So do call in 0345 6060 text 84850. If you want to know why they're striking, ask them. If you want to know what it's like to be on an NHS ward late at night for the fourth day in a row, we'll be exploring that with them. So please do call 0345 6060 and answer me this basic question. Has anything changed? Do we still trust doctors more than politicians? Is there anything about this latest news, this latest proposed strike that makes you change your mind away from supporting the doctors? 0345 60973. You can text 84850. Peter says, hi, Stig. I think the public should support our junior doctors 100%. These people save lives and politicians and right-wing commentators will be the first to run to them if they had, say, a heart attack, stroke, etc. Overworked doctors could be a danger to their patients. Jeremy Hunt should be sacked. He is toxic and hated by the doctors and by us. That is the case for the prosecution against Jeremy Hunt. What are your views on this? Do share it with us now. And, and you got a chance. Two doctors very willing to answer your calls about what it's like to be a doctor. So after this hour, we'll be able to go away and say... We know why they're doing it. We know what it's like to be a doctor because we've asked them. 0345 6070 I'm Stig Abel. This is LBC. It's now 5.16. Stig Abel here uh, this Sunday afternoon, joined by two uh, junior doctors, Dr. Marian Naranha and Dr. Rishi Deer, who are taking your calls about what it's like to be a doctor and the reasons why they feel they should be striking. Uh, people are texting and calling in. So do call in with your views on the junior doctors. 0345 6060 or text 84850. James uh, from Barnes says, Hi, Stig, could you ask the junior doctors why they march under the socialist workers banner? Which is kind of this, the politicisation of this strike. Some people uh, in the press and elsewhere say there's a kind of desire to be militant for militancy's sake. Mm -hmm. You want to take down Hunt. You want to take down the Tory government. Do you feel concerned that the cause is being politicised in some way? Um... Well, I think, you know, with all these things, there'll always be people who want to push their own agenda, whatever you do. I I want to say that I think junior doctors in general have been a hugely apolitical group. This is the first time since 40 years that we've ever rallied together under one cause. And it's amazing, it really is, to see that people with so many different political backgrounds can all be together fighting for what we think is the NHS and our patient safety. We want to stop um, this government taking apart our NHS just bit by bit and we want to be together to fight against that. It, it, politics is, you know, to the side as far as we're concerned. So there's no part of you that, or part of, not you personally, but your, your sort of fellow travellers, as it were, who you think are in it to, to have a go at a Tory government? I think it's I think it's slightly insulting by some of the press to some of the labels that they've given to some of my fellow colleagues, things like Marxists, left wingers, militants, those words that have been used. Um, I know that there's people within the junior doctors forum who support um, Tories, who support Labour. We're not here to endorse Theresa May, to endorse Corbyn, to endorse Owen Smith. We're here to endorse the NHS. At the end of the day, 
I voted for Tories in the last um, government. I've spoken to Jeremy Corbyn recently because I found that he was willing to listen about the NHS. At the end of the day, I'm here to do the best for my patients. I'm not political. I'd be very happy to sit down with Prime Minister May. I'd be very happy to sit down with Mr Hunt if he would want to listen to us to talk about these issues because these are important issues. And I think it denigrates the whole process by saying that we're just militants trying to march under a left-wing banner to cause trouble for trouble's sake. The only trouble we're trying to cause is to look out for our patients. Uh, Charles has called from Birmingham. Hi, Charles. Hi. Uh, what's, what's your point? Well, my point is my partner works for the NHS on the mental health side, same with all her colleagues. They work on social hours like today on weekends. They're not allowed to strike, and they are not allowed, and they do not get any extra pay. So my point is this. How come on one side of the NHS my partner's allowed to strike, yet these junior doctors can strike? It's like rules for one side and rules for another. It's totally unfair. Do you guys know anything about this? Whether the, What exactly does your partner... Don't give a name, but what exactly does your partner do? Um, she looks after the people in society with mental health problems. Just like um, being to prison, uh, drug addicts... Oh, I see. So, so, mental, so, so, mental problems. So she's kind of, a, so, kind of in the sort of social services area? No, no, not social services. It's called um, a community care nurse. OK. A research or something like that. that. She looks after them, she does the medication, like which people have got schizophrenia and that kind of thing. OK. Uh, do you guys know anything? Because I mean, it's an interesting point. Not, let's take nurses generally, actually. Mm. You're striking because of, um, as junior doctors. Are you mm. concerned that, that nurses are getting left left behind in this debate a bit? I mean, what I've, what I've mentioned previously is that I think that, you know, the, the NHS is a multidisciplinary service. It runs not just on doctors, it runs on nurses, phlebotomists, physiotherapists. And I've mentioned many times that to deliver a full quality seven day service, we need all of those services to be improved. Um, I can't speak in this particular case because I don't know what the, the legal legal ramifications are of being able to strike or not. As I say, a strike is a last resort. It's a resort when talks have broken down, when nobody wants to listen. We're standing up here because we don't want this contract, a contract which has been shown not only by ourselves, but by the government themselves to cause harm. It's coming in in four weeks. So the timing is very imperative as well. And so if you're looking at, as doctors, we look at risk balance, risk assessment all the time. And the risk of endorsing and being complicit in the contract that causes patient harm is far worse than the alternative. Uh Marin, do you think though that there is an argument that by saying this is going to happen in September the twelfth, I know you're, you're that mm. as Rishi just said, well, look, in October the contract's yeah. going to be imposed, but all of a sudden you're saying to a group of people, potentially your senior colleagues, in just a couple of weeks' time, you're shutting down for five days, you're placing them in peril, you're placing patients in peril. Could you have not said we're striking, but we're going to give a little bit longer to enable there to be contingencies in place? So I think that you know, so Ellen actually, that's the head of our JDC, actually gave adequate notice so three months ago she said to the government if you impose this contract we will be looking at more industrial action in the next few well in October she said in September October yeah. and she gave all that notice the actual dates were not released until a few like yeah. last week but that notice was given she and met was Jeremy adequate Hunt on July the 7th exactly. and July the 26th and she said there would be strikes in early September if we couldn't reach, reach a resolution and then on August the 7th it was released publicly that because there was no resolution that it was released yeah. well, and that it? was to give adequate notice and to allow the government to really think about it and go allow the reshuffling to happen and to see whether there would be any movement. Um, one of your colleagues, um, in the broadest sense of the term, Matt, an anaesthetic registrar, has uh, texted, Sam, I'm a junior doctor of seven years, totally disagree with the contract terms and conditions, contract imposition, and the government's unrealistic dream of seven-day elective services, services without spending any more money. So effectively, mm -hmm. your position. However, the BMA completely mishandled the previous negotiations and the proposed strike escalation. I feel they have lost credibility with members and the public. And as such, the junior doctor cause is in a worse position. Do you think there's any merit to that, that charge? I think I think I can understand what, what Matt is saying there. Um, I think there has been a lot of misunderstandings as a result. As I say, though, the BMA represents its membership. The membership don't represent the BMA. The BMA have chosen to put the contract, they chose to remain neutral and put that to a referendum of their membership, i.e. us. And we rejected it out of hand for the reasons that I've mentioned. But you didn't get a referendum on these strikes, did you? The we didn't get a referendum, but we were sent a survey prior to the meetings asking what we would be 
um, prepared to do yeah. and how far we would be prepared to take it. Yeah. And they discussed the results of that and Do we survey. know what the results were? I don't know what the results were to you. The results were that we decided to strike. That was the, the overwhelming action that people wanted if we couldn't reach a solution. But there was only a 16, reportedly a 16, 14. As I say, reportedly, account. reportedly, yeah. from sources that have not been named and from things that have not been named. But the either. BMA, could, if it was untrue, the BMA yeah. could have come out and said, sure. that's not true, but they've, yeah. they've, not, they've not commented on it. What, I, yeah. I think the thing is, is there's no easy solution to this. I personally, when those strikes were announced, felt sick. I... I actually physically felt sick. There is no doctor in this country that wants to be out on those picket mm. lines instead of treating our patients. Yeah. Uh, no one. I, I could, li you know, that is absolute fact. Mm. I don't want to strike. No one does. And we're in a difficult position because in, in on one hand, we want to do the best we can to stand up for the fact that we think this contract is dangerous and and is going to be fundamentally damaging to the NHS. And on the other hand, we we care about every single patient that is going to be in that hospital when we're out on those picket lines. Uh, ben is on the line from Cardiff. Hi, Ben. Hi there. What's your question? I would like to ask both of your guests if they would ever consider having an across-the-board pay deduction in order to fund additional doctors, which would reduce the pressure on the service and increase the patient's well-being. If it really is all about the patients. This was this issue of, I mean, from my point of view, Ben, I'm not sure anyone would voluntarily take a, a pay cut. The argument should be you should pay for what you're, you're, you're worth. But it's an interesting point. But if, 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 it, if, it's, if there's a limit of how much money is available, I work for a private company. Recently, we had discussions about if we would be able to be given pay rises or not. And it was decided it'd be better for the service if we didn't take the pay rises now. We waited until the service improved and when there was more money available then we would do so. But okay, that, 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 if it's truly not about the pay, surely and, that should be an option rather than withholding labour. I, I think that's... We're we, we are not asking for a pay rise, and I think that that is the first thing that we need to make absolutely clear. We we have never at any moment asked for more money. But you're getting more money, aren't you? So no, we're not, because it's a cost-neutral contract. So the whole point is that it's a cost-neutral pay packet. But so, some people, some doctors are getting what amounts to a 13% pay increase in terms of basic wages, but that's is that then set against exactly, the fact that you're not getting exactly. the anti-social exactly. hours? Exactly. So you guys, I don't want to know any figures, but... Uh, if this contract is imposed, your pay packet in 2017, what does that look like compared to, to now? Is it the same? Um, so I know that I haven't actually plugged in my salary into the pay calculator, but I know that I have to be my salary will have to be pay protected for the next until I graduate, until I kind of finish my training to consultancy, which would obviously not be necessary if I was going to have a pay neutral outcome and that obviously isn't going to affect me but my concern is that it's going to affect those any &E trainees who are coming behind me in a speciality that's already super hard to recruit to if they're then being asked to do more antisocial hours for less money you know it, in the end it's a work-life balance isn't it yeah i think that's fair well listen, we'll come back to cause I, I want to get into a bit more what it's like on mm -hmm. the on you know on a daily basis what it feels like because a couple of people have uh, have made um, this point about what it's like to go to a hospital at the weekend when it's not mm. just doctors that there aren't enough of, there's no one else mm. there. And mm. the problem is if you don't invest in everything, yeah, you, you might have, have four more junior doctors standing yeah. around with no one to do an x-ray or no yeah. one to, to, to do blood testing. Um, so we'll get into that. And like I said, this is your chance. You've got two very reasonable doctors. And, you know, as Ben did, ask a you know, pointed question, would you be willing to take a pay uh, cut or, or, or not accept a pay rise? You can ask them a question about what it's like, why they're in it, why they feel like they have to stop doing what they do best, which is looking after you. 03456060973. And you can tell me where you now stand on the junior doctors. Has this taken you to a place where you support them less? And if so, why? Because we can have that debate here as well. 03456060973 or text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Uh, Dr. Marianne Naronya, Dr. Rishi Deer, they've taken the time out on a Sunday to take your call. So please do take advantage of that. And we'll be doing these calls after the news. It's news time now here on LBC. It's 5.31. And the headlines are with Philip Krisikos. Well, I'm joined uh, for this whole hour by Dr. Marianne Naronya and Dr. Rishi Deer, both junior doctors, to answer your calls about what it's like to be a junior doctor. And I want you to call and ask, because what I don't want to get to the end of this hour and people to think, you know what, I don't know why they're striking. Because I want you to, A, 
know why they're striking and b if you don't agree with it if you think it's not a good idea if you think i'm angry that the junior doctors are striking put it to them so they can explain a little bit more why if you if you're going to lose an operation because of the strike if you're going to get delayed in terms of your health being treated call and explain what's happening to you and so we can put it to these doctors and they can explain why they feel that is a sacrifice worth making so i want to get to the hour with a sense from you guys are we still in the corner of the junior doctors? Because I start from that position because I know if my kid is sick when I go home after this show, who are the people I'm going to be relying upon to look after them? It's not going to be Jeremy Hunt. It's going to be a group of people who've devoted their life and their training to make people better. And I can't really see past that. So that's what I want to explore with you. 03456060973. We're going to go to calls in a minute. Uh, but Rishi, you wanted to raise a point that Ben called in and said, why don't you guys um, don't take a pay rise? you know just say we'll we'll cut back a bit ourselves so the money can be spread out further so we'll get more of a seven day nhs and we'll get more services why don't you guys just do that so so just in answer to ben's question so we've actually had a pay freeze for the last five years with rising inflation so actually we've had a net pay cut i've got a year to go in my training so actually the pay won't affect me directly but i feel that we're fighting for something much more important the government seems to have this rush to push through seven-day services without even a funding plan of how they're going to be delivered. At their own public accounts committee, where Charlie Massey was grilled earlier this year, he couldn't give a figure on what it would cost for that. So we, first of all, need the government to produce those figures. If there isn't any pot left, I personally think there is. I think it's being diverted into the wrong things. But if there isn't, then that needs to be made transparent to people. You don't get that by forcing through a contract which is going to cause harm. Um, and one other point I just need to very quickly make, Stig, is I think this hasn't been reiterated enough. As, as well as the, I think it's it's common knowledge now that we're trying to squeeze five days into seven on no extra funding. But of another problem, and this is I think is probably even a more important problem, is there is no whistleblowing protection in the new contract. So what that means is if junior doctors see that a patient is having harm done to them, if there's any malpractice, they will not be able to report it without fear of getting struck off, without fear, and it's happened to people before. And the third point is we don't have employment law. We don't have a named employer on our contract. Health Education England decides a junior doctor's career, but is completely exempt from any tribunal rights. So it means after 10 years of working in the health service, I do not have rights to a tribunal. Is, so this, is this a problem, effectively, that decisions are being made for political reasons and that the, the, the consequences are on the ground? Absolutely. And, and the yeah. point I'm trying to make is you are pushing doctors now between a rock and a hard place. You're asking us to endorse and be complicit in a contract which we know, which the government's own risk assessment team has known, causes harm. And then you're not giving us any recourse to whistleblowing or contractual rights. So that is going to lead to a culture of cover-ups. Is that what you want? Do you want another mid-Staffordshire? Because that is what will happen. And that is what we're fighting against. When people talk about strikes, I, I want people to ha look at, have a look at the bigger picture. Striking is a very dark day. It's something which we can avoid. It's something which we want to avoid. But look at the consequences if we allow this imposed contract to go through. I, I guess the problem is someone's just texted me to say, which is 84855 if you want to text in. If your child is ill, Stig, during one of the four or five day strikes and doesn't get treatment, will I still support the junior doctors? Because actually, people are, correctly I am, selfish. I care about the local. I care about my kids and my family. Mm. And you must worry about that. This this thing that everyone said, and I had this thing on, on Sky on uh, last week. Someone will die as a result of your strikes. Do you do you believe that fundamentally, uh, Marianne? Do you accept that? And is that just the risk that you have to, to take? This has got to such an extreme position. The, pro the proposition, someone is going to die as a result of your strikes. Do you have to accept that and still do it? Um if I had, if I accepted that some that a patient would die because of my strikes, I wouldn't be striking. I don't believe that. I believe that maybe, obviously, elective work will have to be cancelled and postponed. I accept that, but I would not be on the strike if I thought that a child would, you know, come to any harm. I work in a paediatric A and E. I'm subspecialising in paediatric emergency medicine. I'm going to be on the shop floor tonight. I'm going to work after this. I know that my consultants back us 100%. They are the most qualified people I know. Some of, you know, between them, 15, 20 years, more years experience between them. They are more than capable of handling any emergency that happens in the hospital during our striking days. And I know if anyone came out to us, even though we were on the picket lines and said, guys, we need you, we'd be in like a flash. Yeah. Uh, James is on the line from Sidcup. Hi, James. 
Oh, hi there. Um, could I just say I'm totally in support of this action, and uh, I'd just make this point, just put the, the, the quick context. The, the NHS, is an, uh, in terms of value for money, is a miracle. It's a miracle every day of the year in comparison to any other health system across the world. So let, let's just put that there. But um, I had an uh, extreme experience of um, shortage of doctors midweek, not weekends, when I was in hospital on a heart ward. There was one junior doctor to cover three wards. Mm. Mm. That doctor was called that evening, and uh, after six hours, the uh, nurse in charge, I think they will probably know what that means, the head nurse of the hospital, mm. Mm. Um, uh, had to come because no one else had authority to change my uh, medication write-up. Mm. This is habitual. My question to the junior doctors is, and I'm interestingly about uh, mid-staffs, um, why this hasn't happened earlier? Mm. Because it's quite clear that the NHS has been in crisis mm -hmm. for well over at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And these guys, are, are, are suddenly, suddenly the light came on when one, one of the, them actually said they're fearful as individuals, they have no right mm -hmm. to raise health and safety issues. Mm -hmm. I sensed fear in the hospital I was in amongst the nursing staff mm -hmm. and the junior doctors. And the fact of the matter is their only strength is when they're together. Mm -hmm. Well, before and, they uh, answer I'm that, because uh, Lynette's also on the line, who has longer experience in the NHS, who doesn't agree with that, that it could have happened earlier. She believes that, fundamentally, I think, Lynette, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you don't recognise an NHS where people should be going on strike. No, I don't. When I first joined the NHS, it was a long time ago, we were made clear to us that it was a 24-hour um, job and our, our present to the, uh, to the patients was giving up Christmas Day. My partner was also a, um, a consultant surgeon and because he was a um, consultant surgeon, he was looked on as a, some sort of spiritual god or a spiritual being. He, he could do no wrong. And he hated that. And he, he used to do five days on um, call and do his normal duties at the same time. So is your point, uh, so, so James's point is you could have done this five years before. Lynette's effectively mm. is it's been ever thus. Once you sign up as a doctor or a surgeon, you know you're going to get screwed in terms of your hours. Mm, you know absolutely. you're going to be working antisocially. Absolutely. Uh, what has really changed? But this drive to bring in seven day non-emergency services, that wasn't there several years ago. That wasn't there to bring in seven day non-emergency services on the same resources without increasing any auxiliary services that wasn't there i know but we have to increase all the auxiliary um, services as well i do know that and, 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 and I, 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 I really services as well and, and i i agree with you there i think we do have to increase all the auxiliary services but the problem is without any funding i don't know how we're going to do that and my concern is my concern is not about working long hours. As I said, I've worked the last five Christmases in a row. I've, I've, I've missed funerals. I've missed weddings. I've missed family functions. That's, that's what I signed up for as a doctor. I, sign, I stay regularly four, five, six, seven hours sometimes unpaid every day because that's what it takes to get the job done. I don't complain about that. What I'm complaining about is the ability to be able to do my job safely where I'm putting other people's lives at risk mm -hmm. and to be complicit in that. I don't think I could live with myself. If, I, if I, my actions led to harming a patient for a non-emergency operation, if I brought a patient in for a hip replacement, say, for example, and I could not safely monitor them on the ward and something bad happened to them, I would have to look in their eyes. I'd have to look in their family's eyes and say, I'm sorry, I brought them in knowing harm would come to them knowing it wasn't safe to do that, and yet I still went ahead with it. Not only is that legally negligible and indefensible, I think it's ethically indefensible as well. So your point, your, his point, Lynette, here is that it's, the ethical position is to strike. It would be ethically wrong to not strike. Do you buy that? No, I'm afraid I don't, because it's the same all over the world. I've worked overseas as well, and my partner was trained in Buenos Aires. And... Our government's problems were they took away grants where they helped people train free and then they made conditions after training to pay back the government for their training. OK, well, I think that's probably taking into an area that isn't that helpful. But um, one of the things someone's just texted in, which I think we'll deal with after the, the, the breaks, because you guys are here to answer this point, the public have not been told what the junior doctors are striking about. They just say it's unsafe. And I think what we need to get from you is 
what exactly is it that's unsafe about it? Which we'll come to, I don't want to give you a proper amount of time to, to, to reply to that because that to me is the critical question mm -hmm. here. Uh, it's very easy for people who are critics yeah. of you to say it's all about pay and it's very easy for you with respect to say it's all about patient safety. But until we actually hear what that patient safety issue is, I think it becomes a rhetorical argument. So after the break, stick around. And if you want further calls, further questions, do put them in 03456060973. But I want to get in mm -hmm. to that and ask these guys, tell us an experience that makes you worried, because I think that will illustrate it to everybody. Um, stick around. Stig Abel on LBC. I'm joined by Dr. Marianne Naronya and Dr. Rishi Deer, both junior doctors, to take your calls about why they are striking. And the text has come in 84850. The public have not been told what the junior doctors are striking about. They just say it's unsafe. Are they being asked to work weekends but have two days off in a week at other times, like thousands of other workers, and they don't like it because no extra pay, which is what I think? Or is there another reason? Please, can they tell us why it's unsafe? And is the scenario, as I have described, I feel their strike is wrong. The BMA agreed the previous deal is being fair. Leave the BMA because the, the leadership agreed it and then the membership rejected it. That, I think, is the critical point members of the public want to know. Is it just you wanting to get paid for Saturdays or... If it's unsafety, the lack of safety that you're concerned about, mm. what is that? Make Paint the picture for us. So just, a, just as an example of my week this week, OK, I will have worked 85 hours this week. I'm going to work after this radio show. I work in a paediatric A&E department. At least half of those hours have been antisocial. I've been working up till 10 o'clock at night. I've been working three night shifts. I'll go to I'll go to work now and I won't finish until nine o'clock in the morning. That is my normal week. I work antisocial hours. I work nights. Um, I expect to do that. What it is a real struggle at the moment is finding the being able to fill all the gaps that are in the rotor at the moment. We have had um, job adverts out continuously, which we cannot recruit to because no one wants to work in emergency medicine. If you then want to bring in a new contract, which makes those hours, the, the hours that are currently antisocial social, who... It, it, it's going to make it even harder to recruit to that speciality. That means that A&E becomes unsafe. I've frequently been dreading going to a night shift, knowing I'm a doctor down, two doctors down, I'm in charge of the department, knowing that patients are going to be waiting four or five hours to be seen, feeling uncomfortable at to what is happening to those patients before we get to see them. You know, I feel that we're at breaking point already. And if we're stretched even further than that, it will break. And that if you do not have the right amount of doctors to see people on those weekend services, it's going to be dangerous or you're going to take them from the week, put them on to weekend. So then the week are going to be understaffed. And the second point is that this new contract removes the safeguards that were already present, that were, well, inadequate already in the previous contract, but makes it even more inadequate. So before we used to have hours monitoring, and now it's going to be replaced by a guardianship system, which is really prone to being um, unsafe because that, that guardian is employed by the hospital trust. It means that we can't... If, if we have concerns about safety, it's really hard to raise that. Uh, Paul's on the line from Working. Hi, Paul. You kind of got a question Hello. along this hour, along this point, haven't you? Yeah, I just I, I'm, a, I'm a sort of um, just a, I'm a car salesman actually, so I'm completely sort of um, sort of like not very clever in all this stuff. But I just listen to the radio and stuff like that. And all, what I always wanted to ask doctors, those two doctors you've actually got there now, is um, I wanted to know um, what their basically, in a nutshell, what their hours were before May and how much money they were earning, roughly, and how that then changed in May and what their hours are now. And then I want to know what their hours, what they're trying to achieve and what their new hours are going to be and how much money they're going to be earning then. Yeah, so, so without asking them to, to disclose their salaries, I, I think it's a very fair point. Once this contract comes in, yeah, once this contract comes in, what, how does your week or month look different? Yeah, how is it different from May before the first strikes? Then they negotiated a contract then, which was um, obviously agreed that's been much, much better and um, better this and better that and stuff. Um, but now they've decided, obviously, that it's not 
good enough. And uh, I don't want them to sort of talk on behalf of like 10,000 doctors, whatever it is. You know, I just want them to talk on their own personal, individual basis. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Let's, go, let's let him. Rishi, go on. That's okay, so Paul, for, well, my dad's actually in sales as well, so I, I thoroughly respect that uh, profession. But uh, as I was saying, that um, I just need to go back to it because a lot of this confusion is coming because it's saying we agreed the contract in May. One person thought the contract was a good idea within the confines of what he was given. I never agreed it. And nothing okay. changed anyway at that point. And nothing's changed. And my hours have not changed since May because the new contract has not come in yet. Okay, so how are my hours going to change? Well, at the moment, I find that I'm incredibly understaffed. I'm working on rotors where I'm covering um, 130 patients in fracture clinic. I work as an orthopedic surgeon with three, three doctors. So that means three of us, we're spending three minutes a patient. So we're already being stretched to breaking points. What will happen is if yeah. you start bringing in extra clinics and lists at weekends, they'll take us from the from the midweek. I already work weekends. I work nights. I work weekends. That's how I do it. Okay, so I might do a, yeah. depending on where I work, I might work one in six weekends, or or I might work every four weeks. I might do a set of nights. That's how it works at the moment. So what they do yeah. is they might take me to cover like instead of like a Tuesday where I'm working a few days, they'll they'll make me work those those weekends. That's fine, shifting people around. But some of the, it's the fact of the increasing services that you're going to put. You're not going to replace the doctors you take from the midweek oh. position so, so, so how in a nutshell, is your life going to be better from this strike yes or no is so, your life going to be better better time with your family and stuff and better working hours because you're going to strike and is the you don't have to tell me money but is the money going to be potentially better as well that's all i want so to know. so no no my, my money won't, will, will not be better better i've only got a year to go on my training so actually it okay. won't affect me directly but the money won't be better the money will be worse because I'm one of those specialties that does a lot of emergency hours. So that will be cut. But more um, so family life as well, as you said, will be worsened because you'll be doing more weekends. But what's more important is that let's say that 130 patient clinic on a Tuesday, that number is not going to go down but you'll have a doctor less. So instead of three doctors covering 130 patients, you might have two covering 130 patients. So that's what yeah, I'm worried okay. about. It's that actually the amount of work on each day is not going to decrease, but the number of doctors will because they've got to stretch them. So in some ways, your life, your life is not dramatically going to get worse if this contract is imposed. Effectively, the level of care, the number of doctors treating other people will get worse. The number of doctors treating other people, oh. uh, yes. And also, um, Paul, the, the throughput won't improve yeah. because you're not improving the other services. So you can't increase the number yeah. of operations on a weekend if you don't have more nurses, more physios. It yeah. just doesn't work. So all you're doing is you're stretching a service to breaking point. You're stretching a workforce yeah. to breaking point. I get all that about the service is stretched and everything else. So, so that, that's why when that we say something's something unsafe, over. we mean that's or doctors won't yeah. get adequate rest. And we think doctors yeah. who don't get adequate rest I will make that. bad yeah. decisions. I think the hours that you work in was a seen amount. You know, I wouldn't do it personally, but... It's the chosen profession that you've gone into. Absolutely. I don't Absolutely. think you should accept it, though. Absolutely. Still, I, yeah. In a nutshell, because I, I go to my AA meeting now, I'm at my AA meeting, um, is your life going to be better off, yes or no, with, with this strike, after you stroke, strike, strike and everything? So if, if they change the deal, will their lives get dramatically better? I don't think it will yeah. get better. It will just be the same, and it will be safer for our patients. Yeah, because they haven't negotiated a new deal yet, so, so you don't know what it's. You don't, don't know, know what's what going to be, be there. Be, Look, so. I think you've done the, what you've done yeah. there is kind of because I've often asked this question: if it's if it's about Saturday pay, why yeah. is it about patient safety? Yeah. And mm -hmm. your point is, if there's more, yeah. if there's doctors spread over seven mm. days, there'll mm. be fewer doctors on each individual mm. given day, which means there'll be fewer doctors servicing the same number of yeah. patients. Exactly. Sting, I worked 33 out of 51 weekends last year. Yep. So okay, so so that's 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 a norm to me. Uh, the reason I mean? that doctors mentioned about no safeguards in regards to reporting the new contract is absolutely new news to me doctors should make a noise about that it's very concerning so we're saying in this new contract you there are no safeguards in terms of your whistleblowing no um why why, well, we, why we, do we, you not we, do we, more we, on that well that's what we have been doing that's why we've been up in arms about that because and that's why i think it's completely untenable because i know that that will lead to a culture of cover-ups and i ask i'm gonna actually direct this to you would you accept your doctors not to tell you the truth would you accept if one of your loved ones was in hospital and something happened to them that your doctors wouldn't honestly report to them i wouldn't accept that no. i'm a patient my mom and dad are patients i wouldn't accept that i want doctors who are going to be open who are going to be honest and that is what it's going to lead to because people will be terrified for their jobs. Um, hi, Stig, says Ron on text. I don't know how to support the doctors. I would if I could. I believe them, not the politicians. Marion, do you want to conclude with us by just saying there is a danger that this new strike, which kind of came out of left field for many people who thought this was problem was more or less over, the public might start wobbling. The public might think, actually, 
I'm not behind the doctors. Just give us your view from the heart why the public should stick with us. All I can say is to the public, please trust us. You trust us with your lives. Trust us in this. We are standing here saying that this new contract will be unsafe or will lead to less patient safety, will lead to your doctors being tired, will lead to a demoralised workforce and will really undermine our ability to talk out if we're unhappy at work about staffing, about safety. Please just trust us like you do with your lives. We're here because we believe in the NHS and we want to provide the best care we can to you. I think that's a very articulate way of putting it. And thank you so much for that. I know you've got to go on, and like me, I'm going to go home and sit around uh, uselessly. You're off to go and work in paediatric a- 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 A&E. Rishi, you've said you've worked 33 of the last 51 weekends. I hope people have had an opportunity to understand what it is like to be you guys and take that in their minds when they consider the issue of the strikes. Uh, Thank you for all your calls on this and all the other issues we've talked about over the last three hours. Don't forget you can listen to LBC whenever and wherever you are by downloading the LBC app. There's also the LBC podcast app to listen back to any shows you've missed. Uh, Coming up at nine o'clock, Steve Allen is in conversation, but up next, here's Clive Ball.